All right, here we are on unit four, last unit of the semester, starting with the Mesozoic era and then including the Cenozoic era, bringing us to the modern day. The Mesozoic era is covered in chapter 17, uh, or ch sorry, chapter 14 of your textbook. And in our little wheel of geologic time, you can see it's right around here. Very exciting. Though it only covers 3.9% of the history of the Earth, the Mesozoic era is arguably the time period that people are most interested in, besides, of course, today. And that's because the Mesozoic includes the time period when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. So let's talk about the Mesozoic Era. The Mesozoic Era is known as the Age of Reptiles. It's the time when dinosaurs became the dominant life form on Earth. It is characterized by the beginning in the very beginning by the breakup of Pangaea towards the end of the Triassic period. At the end of the Triassic period, there's also one of the two mass extinctions in the Mesozoic era. The second one is the one that um, killed most of the dinosaurs, not all dinosaurs, birds are dinosaurs. And it's also characterized by four mountain building events or orogenies. So I've shown you this uh, geologic time scale before. I love it. I think there's so much good information on here. So if you look at the Mesozoic era, you can see that it's broken down into three periods, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. And here are, so you can see at the beginning of the Mesozoic, we see this trailing end of the Absorca um, transgression marked by this big regression. And that's a very short period of time before we have the Zuni transgression, which ends very abruptly at the end of the Cretaceous. Um, and we'll talk about why it's great stuff. In terms of orogenic events, you can see that there's four in the Mesozoic, the Sonoman, the Nevadan, the Sevier, and the Laramide orogenies. All four of these orogenies, as opposed to everything we talked about pretty much in the Paleozoic, are associated with the Rocky Mountains um, and, and Rocky Mountain mountain building. So the Mesozoic begins at the end of the Great Dying, at the end of that huge Permian extinction that ended the Paleozoic era. and it, you can see in the very beginning in the Triassic, you have the first appearance of dinosaurs and mammals um, in the geologic records. Cycads are a type of sort of fern-like plant um, during the Jurassic. Dinosaurs and ammonites, which are a type of coil shell cephalopod, become dominant and birds appear. Um, and then in the Cretaceous, the last period of the Mesozoic, you have the climax for dinosaurs and ammonites um, and Ammonites go extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, and all non-avian or non-bird dinosaurs do as well. Uh, another fun fact is that flowering plants appear at the end of the Cretaceous, which is kind of cool. Flowering plants are known as angiosperms, and it's kind of crazy to think about the fact that before the dinosaur extinction, really, there were no flowering plants on the Earth. I think that's kind of mind-blowing that everything was just greenery, but no flowering plants. Um, and then, of course, the Cretaceous ends with a giant mass extinction, beginning the age of mammals in the Cenozoic. So let's dive into this a little bit more. We'll start with the Triassic period. We'll follow the same sort of sequence that we've been following, where it's like a period at a time. So dinosaurs first appear in the Triassic period. Dinosaurs are reptiles, and they evolved initially from fish. And so fish obviously live in the ocean happily, and uh, breathe through gills. So about 365 million years ago, during the Devonian period, I believe, amphibians first evolved. And amphibians evolved from fish as organisms that can leave the ocean temporarily. Um, a lot, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on in the Devonian. There was a small mass extinction that we didn't really talk about. Um, but it involved um, low oxygen levels in the Devonian Sea. So as an evolutionary adaptation, um, fish, some fish developed the ability to breathe air to come out of the water temporarily, but to have to return to the sea for um, not only for just hydration, but also to give birth. But reptiles begin to, and so here we have some uh, very early, the earliest type of uh, reptiles are called tetrapods. Tetrapods evolve about 300 million years ago. So you have amphibians 365 million years ago, reptiles 300 million years ago. And you can see evolutionarily what happens is you have fish um, fins that evolve into like fingers. And then you still have initially a fin on early um 
early reptiles, but here's a picture or an artist recreation of what some earliest reptiles look like. And you can see that they have some remnants from amphibians with these sort of webbed fingers. The first reptiles are known as archosaurs. They are, which translates to ruling lizard, and they are the ancestor of crocodiles. So here is what's called a phylogenetic tree. A phylogenetic tree basically just shows how different organisms are related. And I stole this one from an article about this particular archosaur, um, but they're not pertinent to what we're gonna be talking about at all. What it shows you though, is that as you go back in time, archosaurs have a common ancestor for crocodiles. And then archosaurs are a common ancestor between crocodiles and dinosaurs. I feel like I ask you about this on your final exam. So put a little star in your notes um, for this diagram. Then from dinosaurs, you have um, some of the main groups here. You have the ornith ornithischians, the sauropods, and the theropods, which we'll be talking about later this chapter. But all of those have a common ancestor. So that's what these little nodes indicate, that there is a common ancestor um, between, for example, theropods and birds. There is a common ancestor right here. And then you have evolutionary sort of uh, deviation from this point. And we're going to get to uh, biology in the Mesozoic in just a bit. First, we're going to talk about some tectonic stuff. Uh, mainly, we'll start with the breakup of Pangaea. So Pangaea begins to break apart in the Triassic period also. And it breaks apart likely due to a huge volcanic eruption called Camp, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, which is a large igneous province that erupted 201 million years ago. So here we see the continents in their Pangaea configuration. And the reddish area, reddish or orange area, is where we could find evidence of this huge series of volcanic eruptions called the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. You can see why, um, right? That it starts actually in the North Atlantic and then extends down to the South Atlantic. Um, the evidence that we have for camp are dikes, sills, and lava flows that we can find in North America, South America, Africa, and parts of Europe as well. And the closest example we have of camp is the Palisade Sill, which is kind of a famous uh, location in New Jersey and New York City. It's this huge lava flow that has columnar basalts that formed as the basalt cooled um, very often. Not always, but often. Large igneous provinces are basaltic in composition and have this sort of darker color. Um, and so this was used for lots of building materials. Um, in the sort of tri-state area down by New York City. Um, so these are, this was this huge volcanic eruption that is kind of normal, like with the breakup of, of super continents. Like the earth doesn't seem to like super continents. They put a lot of pressure on the mantle because you have so much land mass. If you think about isostatic or isostasy, right? The idea that the thicker the crust, the, the deeper it sinks um, in the mantle. And so you have, right, the, um, the moho discontinuity much deeper beneath thick sections of crust. So it's pretty routine that these um, super continents break up as a result of large igneous provinces that seem to come up like right beneath these super um, continents. Very cool, good stuff. But not cool <laughs> if you were a dinosaur running around in the Triassic. So in about 600,000 years, and this is based on radioactive dates from samples of camp, um, about 11 million square kilometers um, erupts in a, a geologically brief period of time. So Huge volcanic eruptions always result in short-term cooling because of ash and debris in the atmosphere, but long-term warming. And um, that is certainly prevalent in the Mesozoic as well. Um, and the long-term warming stuff results in um, 
more acidic ocean water in sluggish ocean circulation, less oxygen in the oceans, all sorts of bad things that very likely contributed to the end Triassic extinction. So this is, there's, <laughs> there's no labels on this graph, which makes it particularly useful, but this is age in millions of years ago. So you can see here's today and here pretty much goes back to the Phanerozoic, the very earliest of the Cambrian. And this is the percent of organisms or the percent of genera most likely that went extinct and this starts with the Cambrian and it goes through here you see the Permian Triassic extinction so this is the great dying um, this is the the end Permian extinction and here's the Triassic extinction um, and these are estimates of extinction levels we know that they're not perfect we know that the fossil record is not in fact close to being perfect but you can see that we're gonna so we have one in the Ordovician um, these ones in the Cambrian are less understood. We have one in the Devonian, we have the big Permian, the Triassic, and then this is the last mass extinction that we have to talk about, the end Cretaceous extinction. So look at, conveniently, the end Triassic extinction occurs 201 million years ago at the same time as camp. So what goes extinct in the Triassic? 35% um, of different marine organisms, and again, this is likely due to low oxygen and sluggish circulation in the oceans, including Conodon. So conodons are those nectic, um, cute little fish that had um, those microfossils that you learned about earlier in the semester. So good stuff. Um, so what caused the end Triassic extinction? We're going to talk a little bit more right after this slide, I believe, about uh, mass extinctions in general. But camp is the um, the sort of smoking gun, if you will. They have the same exact age, the end Triassic extinction and camp. So there's also, um, so methane hydrates are this idea that really became common to discuss, I guess, in the 90s. Um, and so there are certain people who link every mass extinction now to methane hydrates. And so the thing is that camp could actually cause the dissociation of methane hydrates. Um, you could see a little bit of change in the carbon isotope in the end of the Triassic. So there may have been some methane hydrate dissociation as a result of the warming that occurs following camp and during camp. Um, so that's certainly possible. There are certain uh, paleontologists and geologists who think that every mass extinction is the result of an impact. However, there is no crater um, that has been found in very little evidence for a huge volume of... Um, of like the things that we see at the end of the dinosaur extinction like iridium anomalies which we'll get to and uh, there's no crater again also though to be fair there's almost no triassic oceanic crust at all and as we know 70 percent of the earth is ocean crust um and so all of that's gone so it's hard to say that there never was a crater just that there is none today all right so um we're going to talk a little bit more about mass extinctions in a discussion forum and then we're going to pick up with the Jurassic and learn a little bit more about dinosaurs. All right. Have a good time. I don't know why I'm talking like a radio show host. I can't help it. It's just so fun.